Hi, good evening. Uh, well, welcome again to the third in our talks. Tonight we're going to look at, uh, or we're going to hear about Gaudium et Spes. We have the speaker, uh, Dr. Francis Turner from Oxford, um, who knows everything there ever is to know about Gaudium et Spes. So we've got an evening full of entertainment. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm happy to join you this evening, and I'm grateful for the invitation. Uh, Gaudium et Spes is a very long document, as you know. In my printed ed edition, it's about 100 pages. And it's complex enough to lie at the heart of the church's life ever since then. So I need to be very selective tonight. I think my idea is to expand on a few key points, rather than try the hopeless task of covering everything. I ended up last night with a draft that was much too long, so I've cut it down. I have three sections on, um, on the context, on the themes and content, and on the heritage and influence. And I think given the, the title that I agreed with uh, Kevin Clark, Gaudium et Spes, as a turning point in the church's modern history, question mark, I need to estimate how far it has and how far it hasn't been a turning point. I hope there'll be, I, I think I need to leave at about 8.45 if that's okay for my Oxford train. So I hope there'll be some time for questions at, at the end. Just a couple of sentences about the, the whole council. John, John the 23rd expressed his intention to call it in January 1959, which was just three months after he was elected. And the council met every autumn for four years, from 1962 to 1965. There were four so-called constitutions, which were the main pillars of the council, as well as a, a number of declarations on church positions, more specific, and decrees which had some force in canon law. Uh, Gaudium et Spes was the very last document of the council, uh, issued in December 1965. Given the document's commitment to, as it puts it, scrutinize the signs of the times, I think more than usually, uh, the state of the world as well as the state of the church actually define the agenda here. Of course, context always shapes documents, whether recognized or not. But here, context is a formal operative principle. It's a response to these truths about our world. So uh, I, I'm going to begin at kind of reasonable length by just uh, pointing to or reminding you of some of these um, secular and church-related contextual issues that face the council. Of course, there were the two great wars of the 20th century, and there's a dramatic difference between uh, 1900 and 1950, and 1950 and 2000. On the European continent, it's estimated that some 60 million people died directly by violence up to 1950. Uh, the two wars, the, uh, the, ma the massacres in, the, in Russia, and so on. Um, between 1950 and 2000, about one million died. And of that 90% was in the war that f followed the breakup of Yugoslavia. And younger generations, I think, I, I lived in Brussels for nine years working on issues of the European Union, and I found that younger generations had no sense of what it was like um, to live at war. Uh, certainly not if you come from Western Europe. But in response to the Second World War, the foundation of the United Nations, 1945, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, as well as in 1950, the founding of the first institution of what eventually turned into the EU, 
the, the European coal and steel community. And all these responses were in some way uh, a declaration of the commitment never again. Of course, history doesn't quite turn out that way. Then there were the atomic bombs of 1945, the Cold War and the arms race. For example, the Cuban Missile Crisis erupted in October and November of 1962, which was just when the first session of the Council was meeting. From the early 1960s, the, uh, the USA's entanglement in Vietnam, which gradually divided the USA itself. And also from the early 60s, the beginnings of the civil rights movement. <coughs> Decolonialization. <coughs> the first country in the British Empire to become a colony was India in 1947. The first African country was Ghana in 1956. I lived in Ghana for uh, two years at one point. And I also uh, have quite often had work in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, 1960. And of those three, the first, India and Congo, became colonies and immediately uh, found themselves in chaos. Um, in the case of Congo, sowed rather cynically by the Western powers. And yet there were, and this is part of the context of the Council, there were high hopes, I think, that this emergence of new nations from, from being parts of empires would lead to a more equal and less divided world. And so it, part of Vatican II is a geopolitical climate that was quite optimistic. The optimism didn't take long to be punctured. And also in the West, <coughs> uh, in Western Europe anyway, for most of this period, a general and consistent rise in living standards. My experience as a child was every year my parents were a bit better off. And I thought that that was how the world worked. Uh, my nephews and nieces are not better off than I was at all. No. And so the 1960s was the so-called first development decade of the United Nations. And for example, the classic statement of that was uh, an influential book by a US economist called Walt Rostow, or Rostow, called Stages of Economic Growth. And he proposed a kind of partnership model which would tend towards progress and would be supported by mutual goodwill. So poor, or as they said in the 60s, underdeveloped countries, needed to be brought off to what Rostow called a takeoff point, after which they would develop rapidly and independently. They wouldn't necessarily catch up with the richer nations, but they would share increasingly in the world's growing prosperity. And I think that Vatican II broadly accepted this paradigm. Um, it was a world that was full of hope for a better political and economic world. Of course, looking back, that gave way in the early 70s, not from a model of harmonious developments, but what the economists called a model of center and periphery, whereby the center is always living at the expense of the periphery. And so the model was not of convergence, but of conflict and marginalization. If we turn to the church context, well, ever since the, uh, the, uh, the 18th century Enlightenment and the French Revolution, um, and the great, the, f the famous 19th and 20th century philosophers and scientists, Feuerbach, uh, Darwin, Marx, Freud, and so on, the church consistently lost prestige and power in geopolitics. Before that, the church was itself a great power. Gradually, it got marginalized from politics. Um, so, for example, in 1870, when uh, just a year after Vatican I was finished, the loss of the Papal States. And for 20 years after that, uh, the Vatican 
instructed Italian Catholics not to vote. And then after that, they said, yes, do vote, but vote this way. <laughs> of course, by Vatican II, the ground had shifted. There were, in the 20th century, there were very influential philosophers and theologians. You know, the famous names like de Lubac and uh, Chenu, Théard, Jacques Maritain, in Germany, Karl Rahner, the young Joseph Ratzinger, in the United States, uh, a, a Jesuit moral theologian, Jean Courtney Murray, who actually was a consultant in the drawing up of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So there was an increasing group of intellectuals, right back from the 20s and 30s, who took a very different approach to the world than the dominant church had taken before. We'll come back to this theme. Then there was the membership of the Second Vatican Council itself. At Vatican I, 1869 to 70, there were just over 700 bishops. Almost all, bar about 10, were European. Vatican II had 2,000 bishops present, and there were 500 others from communist countries who couldn't get there, not allowed to leave their own country. Of those, 38% were from Europe, 31% from North and South America, 20% from Asia and Oceania, and already 10% from Africa. So Europe was still dominant compared with its slice of the global population. But it was much less dominant than 100 years before. And in fact, that dominance hardly changed till the election of Pope Francis, who was, of course, as you know, the first non-European Pope, and who doesn't see the world at all from a Eurocentric point of view. Despite that fact about the bishops, though, the Roman Curia was still almost exclusively staffed by Italians. And it was, uh, I think this is not disputed, uh, some people liked it, some people didn't. It was a stronghold of uh, resistance to the new movements, a stronghold of centralization. And that curia, so-called, didn't appreciate, I think, how things had changed. So when John XXIII proposed the council, it was a shock to the curia. That wasn't in their plan at all. And then I think they saw it as a chance to reassert the church's authority in the face of this increasingly chaotic modern church, uh, the decline of Catholicism, and so on. But then they had a, a separate shock in the very first session. I don't think I have time to tell this story, but briefly, uh, the arriving bishops who didn't know each other, they didn't know any bishops outside their own country, by and large, were presented with a list of those who had worked on the preparatory documents. Uh, and their job was to elect immediately those who would work on the documents of the council. A pretty broad hint that these are the people who you should probably elect, because there was no time to discuss. And then what happened within one day, quite a few of the influential European cardinals, Suenens from Belgium, uh, <coughs> others from Germany and France and so on, put a counter-proposal that the council fathers should have three or four days to discuss among themselves and decide who to vote for. And the first session of the council was, um, was closed and postponed after 15 minutes. <laughs> so that, that was the shock. Okay, so that's something of the context. <clears throat> so if we come to the themes and the content of the council, uh, I'll I've given you a selection of quotations and I'll use some of those anyway as the basis for uh, my reflections. But I have to quote the first one in, uh, in full because it's the sentence by which almost everybody knows Vatican II. And it's decisive in a way. The joys and the hopes, this is the first sentence of the document, the joys and the hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the, the men of this age, 
but that's another point I mentioned in a footnote. Especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts. <clears throat> Let's just get the men business out of the way. Uh, ev uh, even feminist philosophers and theologians who emerged in the 1960s, they used that language. There was a famous book by Rosemary Radford Ruther in 1973, appealing against this kind of non-inclusive language. It was taken for granted. And I'm only going to apologize once for all the men's and mankind's and so on. Uh, it would be unacceptable, I think, now, because it would not communicate. Uh, I, I have one prayer in the modern missile, which I, I, makes me squirm. Uh, so then I'll be done with it. It's the collect to the feast of St. Bridget of Sweden. O oh Lord, who has made St. Bridget of Sweden a new man in your image? <laughs> and quite apart from cultural sensitivity, this is pretty tin-eared, it seems to me. Anyway. But those first sentences give the entire perspective that structures the whole document. The church's agenda is not set by itself. This is what's revolutionary about Gaudium et Spes. Our concerns, our anxieties, are not primarily about our own personal salvation, about our own status as sinners, which of course we still state at the start of every Mass, or about the Church's own um, status as an institution. What is our primary concern are the griefs and anxieties of the people of this age. And the second quotation, continuing to set the tone, underlines that, but now relates it to the church's mission itself. To carry out this task, the church has always had the duty of scrutinizing the signs of the times, the famous phrase, and of interpreting in the light of the gospel. In language intelligible to each generation, she can respond to the questions which men ask about this present life and the life to come and about the relationship of one to the other. I think this is almost the main point I, I want to make this evening. It's new in a way. It's certainly new in its foundational status. There is no church without mission. Christ is precisely the one who gives his life for the life of the world. And the church's theological purpose the reason for its existence is to share in that mission of Christ. And so paradigmatically, if you like, in the gospel, when Jesus is asked for the greatest commandment, he refuses to say the love of God without adding, and your neighbor as yourself. The second is like to this. And yet there'd been some, for some centuries really, a conception of the church as, and this is a technical term which I need to explain, uh, associatus perfecta, a perfect society. It didn't mean that the church was flawless, still less did it suppose that Christians, including church leaders, are free from sin. You'd need to be blind to history to, see, to say that. But rather the church was held to be perfect in containing within itself by God's grace, all the, all the sources of and resources for its authentic life. It didn't depend on any external agency for its proper fulfillment. For example, the sacramental system consecrated all the key elements uh, and the key transitions of our lives, from birth, from coming to maturity, for marriage or clerical ordination, for dying. The sinfulness of the church members, the, the terrible propensity we have to mess everything up, could be forgiven and absolved through the church. The Pope has his confessor. And sociologically, uh, uh, the church, right through till Vatican II and short, till shortly afterwards, often had a network of institutions that nourished Catholics from cradle to grave. Youth clubs. Um, 
kind of um, leisure centers, even arrangements to dating agencies so you could be sure to meet other Catholics and so on. Now the problem with this term, the term societas perfecta comes firstly from Aristotle, it's a philosophical term and he applied it to the state. The state, unlike a family, has the resources it needs for its own proper purpose. But the trouble with the phrase, I think, is that what, there's an easy slide from what is a technical term to a, a moral claim. We are the perfect society. We are the ones who judge you who are not perfect societies. If, though we say that the church is essentially and above all for mission, then the church can't be defined as separate because it's defined by its relationship with those whom it's mission to. Just as there's no such being as an individual human being unrelated to others, so there's no such thing as a church unrelated to the wider world. And if you are a person or a being in relationship, you're not self-sufficient. That's the great lie of individualism. We have relative autonomy as distinct centers of consciousness and so on. But we don't have absolute autonomy. Uh, every serious relationship is a mutual dependency, recognized or not. I say this perception was not new in the sense of being a philosophical insight, but it was new as being taken as fundamental to the life of the church. So relationship with the world isn't just something the church does, it structures the life of the church. And so it shapes our sense of the priority of truth, the prior forms of service. I think that sense was growing in the council, in the church in the years before the council, and no doubt in the two years, the three years of the council, which led up to Gaudium et Spes. The world's issues are, by definition, the church's issues. We can never say that's none of our business. And that's why I went at some length into the secular context. <clears throat> On the other hand, this insight doesn't collapse the church into the world. On the contrary, it, it highlights the church's distinct vision of the world itself and of human life. A few examples. A government uh, is elected by a particular people and it must put those people first. So naturally their interests are prioritized even over the urgent needs of those who are not your country folk. But Christians can't think quite in that way. Christians cannot think that an Iraqi or a Syrian or an Afghan life is intrinsically of less value than a British life. I mean, the best example is the current debate about asylum, for example. I, I've worked, I, I, I was the bishop's advisor here for seven years on international affairs, and those are the issues I worked on in Brussels. Even the most conservative church leaders are often fiercely critical of their governments on migration and asylum because humanitarianism comes before patriotism. We have to face the problems and resolve them, but we can't deny them. A second example, a foundational Catholic social teaching, given as we'll see in Gaudium et Spes, is that of the common good. And the common good is in stark contrast to the dominant political understanding of our time, which is, I think, based on utilitarianism. The, the popular summary of utilitarianism is the greatest good of the greatest number. Uh, and in political terms, that greatest good tends to be first and foremost economic good. Um, when, you know, when Bill Clinton was asked which issues would define the next election, it's the economy is stupid, he said. <laughs> no. But the common good, 
starts with the good of the excluded. It doesn't start from the good of the most influential and prosperous. There is no common good where those marginal are not included. And that difference leads to a very different sense of political and even economic priorities. In the case of taxation, for just to take one example. Um. <clears throat> and the third point, um, as Christians we accept, I think, that as we engage sometimes vigorously in criticism, let's say, of secular institutions, governments, corporations, um, other institutions, so they have the right to criticize the church. Dialogue is not always painless. And so this immersion in the world leads the church into a new space, I think, where on the one hand, it leads us to uh, analyze what we find destructive. On the other hand, we become more aware of our own vulnerability because people fight back. Um, and the church is much less powerful than it used to be to defend itself. Okay, just to look briefly at some of, some of the main themes. The first is, the dig I'd like to talk about the dignity of the human person. Uh, you have some quotes on the sheep from sections 16 and 17. But in the depths of his conscience, man detects a law which he does not impose on himself, but which holds him to obedience. And then this key set, conscience frequently errs from invincible ignorance without losing its dignity. And I think the word conscience here is used in a much fuller way than has sometimes been used in either secular terms or in church thinking. Uh, in, in an old style of moral theology, um, it's sometimes reduced, you are using your conscience when you try and spot your sins. Um, or the American humorist, rather cynical humorist, H.L. Mencken, defined conscience as that still small voice that tells you somebody's looking. <laughs> <laughs> but rather, Conscience is the fundamental human capacity for discerning and choosing the good, not in the first place spotting the evil. And it must be respected, and this is the new emphasis of Vatican II, including by the church. Uh, you may remember the famous old phrase, error has no rights. No, but in the, the, the thinking of Vatican II, those who may be wrong certainly have rights. In fact, we can't sidestep the decisive role of our own conscience. I could say, for example, along with the most traditional Catholic I can find, I will always accept the judgment of the Pope. Although, of course, in the last 10 years, the traditionalists have stopped saying that because they don't much like the Pope. Um, it can be a, a rational position to take that the Pope knows a lot more about the Catholic Church than I do and a lot more about the global realities than I do. He's got much better information. But no one except myself can take the decision to make the Pope my authority rather than somebody else my authority. And without this freedom and this responsibility of conscience, a freedom of personal decision, for example, my Jesuit vow of obedience would be a mere act of submission to uh, those nasty people who can tell me where I, I'll work in five years' time. And so in section 17, only in freedom can man direct himself towards goodness. If it's not in freedom, we are simply submitting to somebody more powerful. In freedom, we direct ourselves towards goodness. <clears throat> and human dignity demands that we act according to a knowing and free choice that's prompted from within 
not simply under blind internal impulse, so the, the sudden power of our emotions. I'm not determined by the fact that somebody barges into me in the street so that I punch them back, um, or by mere external pressure. And so he, for this, reason is not opposed to revelation, and obedience is not opposed to freedom. And obviously, that freedom that is part of human dignity is very different from what we tend to call neoliberal freedom. It's not the freedom to buy any one of 25 kinds of toothpaste on the supermarket shelves. And it's not necessarily the freedom precious to uh, the right wing of the Republican Party, the freedom to bear arms in public. We are not we need to be free from external oppression. We also need to be free to give our lives to something that's worth giving. And that's the heart of freedom. Freedom to, not simply freedom from. <coughs> and that dignity is the first great principle of Catholic social <coughs> teaching too. But again, it gets complicated. Just one example. There are many different ways of understanding human life or anthropologies. Um, and we can speak of a Christian anthropology. But we don't live in the world where we can simply define how everybody uses the term. You know, Humpty Dumpty, um, words mean what I tell them to mean. But shared vocabulary can be very deceptive. So take dignity. Christians use the word dignity, for example, on the whole, to oppose euthanasia. Our lives are in God. Life and death comes from God. We certainly don't have to hang on to our own lives or others' lives um, at all costs, for example, through extraordinary medical procedures. But we hand over our lives fully to God. Think of the Swiss clinic Dignitas. The title is not a, a cheap, bad claim. It's made in good faith. But it uses that its service is, is euthanasia. Because their notion of human dignity includes, includes the notion of uh, full autonomy. Without, when you lose autonomy, according to the, the, the thinking of dignitas, when you become radically dependent on others in such a way that you can never hope to emerge from that dependency, then you have lost your dignity. And therefore it makes sense for you or somebody else to ask to be um, put to death. For Christians, we, we go through all kinds of stages in our lives of relative dependency and relative autonomy from infancy through maturity to aging to terminal care, perhaps. But in none of those stages do we lose our dignity. And so uh, this, I found this constantly working in Brussels where I was using terms coming from a kind of religious background. And the people I was talking to was using the same word, but to mean something which was very different, ultimately. Um, I'm going to sk skip con uh, considerably here but, uh, because I want to leave some time for talking about the heritage and also some time for discussion. Um, but if we come to economic and social life, some of the sections I've given you from 63 onwards refer to what it calls man's increasing domination over nature the increasing mutual dependence of countries, the increased intervention of the state. One problem it finds there is that many people, especially in economically advanced areas, seem to be ruled by economics. So that almost their entire personal and social life is marked by a kind of economic way of thinking. And still worse, it adds, an immense number of people still lack the absolute necessities of life. Some, even in less advanced areas, live in luxury or squander their wealth. Mm 
extravagance and wretchedness exist side by side. Of course, I can't summarise what's happened in the 60 years since then, but uh, very briefly, the World Bank and the, in the IMF in this development decade genuinely, I think, sought to provide assistance to what was called the Third World. But it did so in part by lavish lending programmes at low interest rates without much oversight. Much of that wealth disappeared into the hands of ruling groups in some of the countries concerned. Then interest rates rose rapidly, and so many countries found themselves plunged into crushing debt. The other side of that is, of course, some governments have successfully taken whole populations out of poverty. In the case of China, hundreds of millions have been brought out of poverty. Although, of course, at the cost of much social oppression and in many cases, the complete denial of human rights and both individual and collective freedom. But one major fruit of Gaudium et Spes is that it gave the church the green light and it, it led to the formation of most modern movements of the theologies of justice. The hierarchical church itself the USA Bishop's 1986 pastoral, Economic Justice for All, proclaimed a kind of option for the poor, which will be a pretty big heresy to many secular Americans. In, Pope, in 1967, Pope Paul VI's encyclical Popular and Progressio, the Progress of Peoples, insisted on the rights of peasants over against the corporations which had stolen their lands and the Wall Street Journal call this warmed-up Marxism. <laughs> if you combine that with the new awareness of theology beyond Europe, then you think of movements like liberation theology, emerging first in Latin America, um, legitimated by Gaudium et Spes, because if you're going to evaluate the signs of the times, then if you stand in Central and South America, the overwhelming sign of the times is poverty and economic oppression. And that was a grassroots movement. But the first Episcopal Synod in Latin America was held in Medellin in Colombia in, in as early as 1968. And that was confirmed after a decade of experience by another one in Puebla in Mexico. And that agenda has not lost its urgency. Okay, so maybe in the last 20 minutes or so, uh, I had a section on political rights, and we can come back to it if you want to discuss. But I think I want to identify some, is some issues in which, Gaud first of all, Gaudium et Spes did not mark a turning point, because I've said it did in the fundamental mindset of the church, which led to all kinds of movements, theological, social, um, and civic, but in some ways it didn't. And how does one assess this? First, I, I spoke at the beginning of the, the conflicts at the beginnings of the council and this victory of the reformers over the powerful curial cardinals. But it's also true there's been a conflict of subsequent interpretations of the council. Some powerful church groups left the church because they couldn't accept some of the council's key decisions. Uh, not so much Gaudium et Spes, but uh, Nostra Aetate on interfaith relations and relations with the Jews. Uh, the Declaration of Religious Freedom. Uh, the church had always claimed the right to religious freedom of its own worshippers over against atheistic states or even over against non-Catholic states. Think of the, the martyrs in England in Elizabeth I. <clears throat> what it had never proclaimed was the religious freedom of non-Christians over against the church and against Christian powers where Christians were in the majority. But now it did. <clears throat> 
on this ground of dignity and freedom. If you compel people, they don't believe. They just say they believe, and that's not the same thing. And so, in a very moderate way, Pope Benedict, for example, proposed that the general assessment of Vatican II ought to be shaped by what he called a hermeneutic of continuity. A hermeneutic is a principle of interpretation. So we should look through the lens of continuity rather than a hermeneutic of rupture, rather than looking through the lens of rupture. So we should stress how Vatican II develops previous teaching rather than stressing those ways in which it fundamentally reshaped it or even reversed it. I'd say with great respect to a learned and holy man, I would say there is as much important change of direction, if not rupture. Rupture in a very few cases, but there was a certainly an important change of direction as there has been a, a development of previous thinking. Or maybe we can say that this same church moved into a radically different period of its existence. Because the church hierarchy, as I've said before, hardly said before Vatican II, that the church is defined by a mission to a world of which it's not, of which it is a part. And yet that's, in fact, the standard theology going right back to St. Augustine. He talked about the city of God and, and, the, and the civil city. Uh, but the line between the spiritual and the worldly doesn't lie between some people and others. It lies within the heart of every person. And as faithful followers of Christ, there is, we all have the shadow side of being the sinners we confess to be. We have a foot on either side of that line, always, just by being human. Now, now some of the issues, have, some issues were raised but have not been resolved. Time moves on, and issues emerge over 60 years that couldn't have been foreseen. And that's not at all a criticism of Gaudium et Spes. There's not much we say today that would help our grandchildren negotiate their lives 60 years from now. And my whole case has been that Gaudium et Spes brought about a key change of mindset which has empowered the church subsequently to respond to these issues, not always adequately, of course, but in a way that Gaudium et Spes couldn't have responded itself. So I mentioned four of those. <clears throat> First of all, there's the decline of this thing that Vatican II still took for granted, culturally coherent Catholic cultures. Um, and the corresponding decline of the prestige and moral authority of the church. If you think of the, the, the traditional classic Catholic communities of Europe, Spain, Ireland, Belgium, these cultures now are as much anti-Catholic as Catholic. If you're not Catholic, you're probably anti-Catholic. I think in England and Wales, where the church has always had less social and political power, the decline has been at least gentler. Um, we're less of a, we were less of a threat before. But of course, the decline in the number of clergy and religious women and men is no less dramatic. I entered the Jesuits in 1974, and the British province, it was then called the English province, though it included Scotland and Wales, were 800. We can call that 650 because 150 quite quickly left to form part of uh, the new province of Zimbabwe, whereas when it was Rhodesia, they were in the British province. So 650. We are now, uh, so that's 48 years since I joined. We are now 112. So that decline. The second is the nature of this economy which Vatican II was talking about. It's been transformed by globalization and by globalized technology. 
In particular, for example, this is the telltale detail I found. In Gaudium et Spes's quite long chapter on the economy, the word finance does not appear. And yet the way the, the whole economy works, the way the economy is not just served by financial institutions like banks, but is dominated by the finance sector, has changed not really since 1965, but since 1980. And it hasn't been stopped in its tracks even by the severe crash of 2008. We can come back to this if you wish. Um, but it's taken the European economy longer to recover from the 2008 crash. Wages, uh, wages of ordinary workers is still lower in real terms than they were in 2007. Of course, the top 1% have rocketed. Uh, but the top 1% are mainly either great inherited wealth or working in finance, investment, banks, and so on. Similarly, the, the, the serious danger of artificial intelligence for human dignity couldn't possibly have been foreseen by Vatican II, but it is now. <coughs> Thirdly, there's been a clear shift, I think, in the character of global conflict. If, at least if we look back, things have changed a bit in the last year. Um, but before Vatican II, global conflict we thought of in the West as somehow falling into capitalist communist or east-west. Since then it's merged substantially into cultural conflicts partly rooted in religion. Obviously I'm thinking of 9-11 uh, and the wars waged in Iraq, in Afghanistan and so on. Those are not capitalist-communist uh, conflicts at all. They're conflicts between whole different scales of value. And part of it, the Islamic world is its rejection of the way capitalism works. Except, of course, you, nobody's going to say that Saudi Arabian Muslims are not capitalist. So it's never... <laughs> um, but the church's commitment to peacemaking has adjusted accordingly. Pope Paul VI, for example, in the 1960s, commissioned the Jesuits to study atheism. Now, uh, we've been called to interreligious dialogue. Because those are the issues of our time, in a way. As I say, now, since February 2022, it's troublingly possible that the invasion of Ukraine, and even in the last week, the possible new alliance between Russia and China will return us to the, a new terror of the Cold War. And you, uh, many people in the room will remember mad, mutually assured destruction. You can't blow us up because we can blow you up. Um, and in, two, in 1962, it very nearly went wrong. And then the last issue, migration. In the 1960s, Britain was relatively liberal on migration. In the year of Gaudium et Spes, 1965, a certain Idi Amin became commander of the Uganda army. Britain had very little hesitation in allowing many thousands of Uganda Asians to enter Britain. But since then, Britain especially, but the rest of Europe considerably, has closed up and tightened up. And migration has correspondingly become a central moral issue for the church. So the biggest Jesuit organization in our time is the Jesuit Refugee Service, which works in more than 50 countries. Because migration, uh, there is no international migration authority with a recognized role of mediating between countries who see things differently and dealing with politicians who too often believe the slogan I used to hear in Brussels that no politician ever wins votes by defending migrants. And that issue will 
intensify further, I'm sure, in the face of foreseeable environmental catastrophe, for which, of course, the industrial nations bear the main responsibility. <clears throat> so those are issues which have changed without any blame attached to God, uh, because the world changes and moves on. I think there are three issues which Vatican II and Gaudium and Spes in particular can be said to have failed to face. Just as the word finance doesn't appear, the word gender doesn't appear, even in uh, the Flannery edition of the whole documents of the Council. The issue of gender itself is treated only in the context of marriage, I think with a side spine about Islamic marriage. And even the word sex appears only in the context of school education and of commercial advertising and criticizing what uh, Gaudium says, says, oh sorry, the, the decree of social communication says the shameless exploitation of sexual instincts for commercial gain. I think we'd now call that probably making women especially sex objects. And yet, what we know colloquially as the pill, the so-called combined oral contraceptive pill, was first approved for contraceptive use in the United States in 1960. And by the, by the mid-1960s, when Gaudium et Spes came together, I think was transforming sexual behavior in the whole Western world. I can't help thinking of, remember rather cheekily Philip Larkin's famous poem, um, uh, the first four lines are, sexual intercourse began in 1963, <laughs> the year of the Lady Chatterley ban and the Beatles' first LP, too late for me. <laughs> uh, but there's no serious treatment of, um, uh, also you can think of David Lodge's wonderful novel, How Far Can You Go, which was written in 1980, but is dealing with this period. In fact, the council simply, there is a section on marriage in the family, but it doesn't talk about the burning issue of contraception. It kicked it down the road till it was addressed by Paul VI in 1968 in Humane Vitae. And all that succeeded in doing was shift the grounds of controversy. The discussion was then not about contraception, but about church authority on contraception. Mm -hmm. how, can, how can this celibate church tell married people how to live their lives? <clears throat> Secondly, of my three points, um, and again, astonishingly in hindsight, the word race doesn't appear, except in a formulation like the human race. Uh, the, the sharper word racism certainly doesn't appear. And yet Rosa Parks had appeared in court for defining, defying the color bar on, in Alabama in 1955. And Martin Luther King was already very prominent by 1965, leading a very powerful civil rights movement. He was assassinated in 1968. And finally, <coughs> uh, there is no treatment at all of uh, ecology in the natural environment. So, of course, nothing about pollution, nothing about biodiversity, nothing about climate. Although, again, one of the most influential books of the 20th century, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, was published in 1962 and was already a core celebre by 1965. So, two, two conclusions. Gaudium et Spes opened the way to two momentous changes which are still being worked out. Take the theme of martyrdom. If you remember Pascal's famous phrase, Christ is crucified to the end of time. Before Vatican II, Catholic martyrs had been executed for upholding church doctrine over against atheism or in England over against the rejection of papal authority. After Vatican II, what tended to bring martyrdom was witnesses in matters of justice. The great symbols, of course, are Archbishop Romero, murdered at the altar in 1980. Its feast day is tomorrow. Uh, 
canonized two years ago. And uh, speaking as a Jesuit, for me, the six El Salvador Jesuits from the University of Central America who were murdered with the two women who worked in their house and were trapped in the house that night because of the army curfew, murdered by the El Salvador military in 1989. And witnessing to uh, faith and its implications in the face of state power was what led them to martyrdom. <clears throat> in addition, we still need to work out, I think, the rather dramatic consequences of Gaudium et Spes's foundational insight that the church is essentially at the service of the world. What I mean is this. Those in the forefront of this service of the world are lay men, lay women. They have, have not even now been accorded a proper competence and a proper authority. I had a very good friend, a Scottish woman doctor called Joyce Poole, who died a few years ago, um, who wrote about this, just one sentence, uh, in a book, uh, maybe she wrote 15 years ago, working in, as a doctor in the Scottish borders, called Dilemmas of a Catholic Doctor. And she, was, uh, she never lost her temper, Joyce, but she, uh, she was quite strong, as you'll hear. The authority of the magisterium of the church in matters within its competence, is not here being questioned. But there is an authority too, residing on those of us who have a lifetime of listening in close and frank contact to the problems of ordinary people. And yet I think we'd have to say that Vatican II missed the need, including Gaudium et Spes, missed the need to look at the structures of the church itself. That wouldn't have been handled in, Vat in Gaudium et Spes particularly. Uh, because uh, it, it would have been probably Lumen Gentium. But the council actually consolidated the top-down nature of the church, especially given the speed of modern communications, which meant that the Vatican could immediately communicate worldwide instantly, rather than over six months, over, as, as the lady here was telling me, nine years to get a letter to China in the time of Matteo Ricci. Um, and it was also strengthened, I think, by the tendency of, of uh, not his fault, but John Paul II became an international media star. I'm not sure it's good for a pope to be a media star, but it, well, he couldn't help it. But the point was, <clears throat> this Catholic hierarchy was in no way made accountable to the Catholic people as a whole. And I think, I have to say, the sexual abuse crisis has showed us how bad, at worst, can be the consequences of this lack of transparency and this lack of accountability. And I think it's only now in the synodal path that Pope Francis is leading us in this necessary journey. So, um, <clears throat> I'll, end, I'll end there. Um, and, uh, but we have, uh, would we have 15 minutes or something for? Yes, perfectly all right. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for that. Somebody have a question. Patrick, you need to talk in the microphone. Oh, yeah. ah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Um, do you have a view as to why Vatican II didn't respond uh, to the impact on communities on the ecological, uh, climatic um, issues that <laughs> prevailed? I think um, probably because they weren't prepared. Um, the fact that uh, it's, uh, awareness was growing, uh, but it's, it's come a long way since the 1960s, and the bishops arrived in Rome without any sense that this would be on the agenda. They would have read the preparatory documents and then they're faced with this, some, we suddenly have to elect people to write new documents. Um, in this respect, they would have been pretty much uninformed. Now, I don't mean it's been, um, it's been, the church has been silent ever since. There are very powerful letters from John Paul, from, from Benedict, and of course from Francis on this. 
um, from certainly from the year 2000. Um, but I think it's probably simply because they, they wouldn't have felt themselves even in a position to become competent in the time scale. So you think it might be on the agenda next for the next one? Oh, I'm sure it would. I, I'm sure. uh, and many bishops' conferences, for example, work on the issue now. Uh, the first one, to my knowledge, uh, well, as I said, I worked for the bishops for seven years as their advisor on international issues, but I wrote the first document on what we call the call of creation. At least I wrote the first draft, and then the bishops, of course, uh, put their stamp on it too. Uh, but, um, and that was in 1998. Uh, already the Australian bishops were way ahead of us. Uh, but the African bishops were still very modest, just 10% of these 2,000, so perhaps 200 Irish African bishops. But they would have felt very junior at Vatican II. Uh, and it, um, I think the, the bishops were not re representing the underclass at Vatican II. Now they would much more. For, for, for example, I, in 2000, I went to Colombia, uh, the, the, um, and I found among the meetings I had there uh, was one with the papal nuncio and one with the British ambassador. The papal nuncio knew much more about uh, what was happening outside Bogota than the nuncio did. And the church, one of its great strengths, if it's operating well, is that it has a, a foot in every community. The synodal process, I'm sure, will develop that much further. At the end there you said something about the synodal path. Um, Gaudium et Spes, it was about dialogue, wasn't it? It was about the church dialoguing with yes. the world. Yes. Can you say a few words about, you know, the, the dialogue and suddenly we're on the synodal path and that's about dialoguing? Uh, other people here may know much more than I. I've not been directly involved. But the, the, the point about the synodal path is, certainly in the view of Francis, is precisely to get um, conversations going between bishops, people, priests, religious, lay people, where everyone has a voice. Uh, so, for example, uh, the synods till, till the last one or two in Rome, I might be corrected, uh, there were uh, very few religious there, but as observers, they had no speaking rights. In the latest couple of synods, some religious have speaking rights. Still no lay people with speaking rights at the Roman synods, but in the synod on the Amazon, they had a, there was a huge preparatory grassroots effort uh, uh, financed by the church to, to enable villagers to come to cities, cities to go to the capital city and have a very different kind of dialogue. Uh, and people were hoping, for example, that there might be immediate concrete changes such as, I remember, women deacons at least. Uh, Francis didn't go that way, but what he has done is there's a hugely greater number of women experts in, uh, in, in Vatican congregations now uh, and lay experts, men or women. So that it's being built slowly into church decision making, but there are always rearguard actions, you know. And there's talk about schism, isn't there, in well, Germany uh, the, the, the or America? The classic one was, was Archbishop Lefebvre, who completely went into schism, yes, uh, left the church, mm -hmm. partly because uh, he, he would not withdraw the language about the Jews as being murderers of the Son of God and this kind of thing. Uh, and then religious freedom, he could not accept religious freedom. Uh, how, how can secular rulers who don't understand Christian faith claim authority over Christian believers? Benedict in London, there's a, he gave a one, the best thing I think he ever did to my mind. If, if you have time to look at a, quite a brief speech given in Westminster Hall in, in 2010. He talks about the mutual relationship of state and church. Uh, 
Christians have a special experience to bring. We bring what politicians don't always bring, which is a real awareness of our own fallibility, our own sinfulness. We refuse at best to get involved in the slanging matches, which uh, a Labour politician is not permitted to stand up in Parliament and say, I agree with the Conservatives on this point. And you just can't because it's, uh, uh, and, and that therefore becomes a dialogue from which all intelligent thinking is removed because you're built in the oppositions in the system itself. And the, that was built in a little bit if you have an image of the bishops as leaders and, the, and the, the, the rather ignorant people as obedient. But that's the model we have to get away from. Uh, the, the best theologians I know are not bishops and the bishops will be the first to agree. They don't have time to study theology in depth. <laughs> you mentioned that Pope Francis is the first non-European Pope and doesn't have the Eurocentric outlook. Can you say a bit more about how that shows in, in what he does and says? <clears throat> um, there were, of course, there were two, his two predecessors were a very different kind of Europeans. Um, Benedict from the classical kind of Western Greek Latin tradition uh, who had a, a rather fierce opposition to the enculturation of theology in Asia in case it prejudiced the unique status of Christ as Savior. Mm -hmm. uh, once we start uh, dialoguing with Buddhists and then is there a, a risk that the, the position of the Christians going into dialogue is only provisional. In dialogue, you should be open to what emerges. That doesn't mean we don't bring convictions into dialogue. John Paul II, of course, had a very different Slavic consciousness, um, which made him acutely aware of some injustices, like the Russian domination of Europe, the great supporter of the Solidarność movement, and so on. But he had much less sympathy when the enemy was not the Soviet Union, but the United States, as it was for the liberation theologians, because there he saw the danger of communism. I think Francis looks through a very different lens here. He also doesn't go well all the way with liberation theology, because liberation theology, at least in its first uh, wave, was rather snooty about popular piety. Is it? Are we, are, they, are we just settling for devotion rather than challenging the injustice? Um, Pope Francis would say these are these are not opposites. Mm -hmm. If you don't draw on your own cultural traditions of prayer and devotion, you will not have the spiritual power mm -hmm. to work for justice. Mm -hmm. Those will be the two main mm -hmm. things, I think. Um, and of course, then now the the European cardinals simply would be a, a small minority. In religious life, we find we are a small minority of people, but a large majority of money. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, because we can't give away our money. Uh, the, I won't speak for the Benedictines, <laughs> but, the British, but the British Jesuits can't simply decide to give 10 million to Africa because we are also a British charity constrained by the British charity law. Um, we, we find ways of doing it, but it's slow, it's much slower. We give all kinds of bursaries and, and sponsorships and so on. So, uh, um, Every Indian, African, even Latin American student at Campion Hall is paid for by the British province. But we have to do it in relatively small sums, in thousands of pounds rather than tens of millions of pounds. Mm -hmm. I think I prob probably need to... You seem to have astounded them, actually. Any more questions or any more ideas? I probably, well, I probably need actually to make sure I get this train to... Well, OK. okay. Well, thank you very much on behalf of uh, Ealing Newman. That was a very enlightening speech. Thank you very much.